Hey everyone, Friday Night Live. Oh, that's right, I made my chair. What about, talk about, Trent, why are you still here? Do you have anything to go and repair? Uh, no, I'll put my stuff away already, yeah? Cool. I'm going to lock it. New video on YouTube, dropped this afternoon. What's it about? Oh, it's um, the long range course in April. Oh, okay, yeah, last yeah, one. Yeah, it's, it's just another one like that. So this is Trent 7mm, and I've made a... Well, that's a bit wobbly. I've made a little extension. This is just a test thing that I'm doing to make. Uh, so I'll make it so when you put the butt on there, that rod will go into a mechanism inside the butt that'll have a over center like lock on it. So we'll just go and lock up and then you can use it. And then put it in safe, we we'll just go lift it up and then pull the stock off and then he can actually fit it in his safe. So that's what I'm playing around with. That's one, one thing I'm building yeah. another 7mm punchy for a client. Yeah, yeah. building a 7mm punchy for a client. I mean, it's taken off. It's, it's, a, it's a calibre that should. It's going mental. It's technically about four times better than anything else on the market. So get in, get one while you can. Have a rifle named after me. How good would that be? Um, so making, no I'm starting to chip away at an idea that I've had for a long time, but um, and I'm also trying to test. This is the bolt out of a Seiko 491, which was their like target model, so it's a much fatter bolt than the standard Seiko, like the um, 461 and that sort of stuff. Um, and so I'm trying to make a, a duplicate of that, so I've machined the bolt head. Um, the next part I've got to do is the back where the shroud fits in at the back, but I've got to get it to key properly, so I've got to make some tooling up to make sure that it keys correctly so everything's in the right position. Now I can machine the back of the bolt for the shroud and the root of the bolt handle, and then I can hold it between centers and turn the body of the bolt so it's correct. Um, so that's something else that I'm mucking around with at the moment. Why are you doing that? Sorry? Why are you doing it? To prove that I can make a bolt like the original Seiko's. I will make mine very slightly differently. I'm not going to make the, the guide rip on the side. So Seiko's had this non-rotating guide rip, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, which had a little, it's got a block underneath with a spring under it and clips into these two recesses in the bolt. So there's one there. So it stops in that position and stops in that position. So it's a guide to yeah. make sure that the bolt can't rotate when it's going back and forth unless it's right at the end. So, and that's a way of guiding. There's other ways of guiding the bolt in the bolt raceway that uses more modern technology and it's nowhere near as complicated. So I'll do mine slightly differently, but the it's a proof that I can make a bolt the same as this because what I'll do is I'll get the bolt and I'll make it work in the rifle that that came out of to prove that it works. And then I'll go on from there and I'll make the next part of the build, which will be obviously the shroud. So I'll make my own shroud as well. Um, and then I'll make the action and the trigger to fit that and etc. etc. So you're just going to build your own very factory rifle? I'm going to build a rifle, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to build my own rifle. Right. But it it's more of a proof of what I of what I'm capable of doing, so that when I actually produce something of my own, like my own design, I know where I'm going to make mistakes and where I need to make modifications and what jigs to make and all that sort of stuff. So it's not well catcher. Bye. See you, Trent. You know what I'm saying? So this isn't something that's going to be a production item for just, clients. Just him tonight. And it's just main build. Um, it's going to be it's a test. Yeah. Right. But anyway, that's something I'm playing with at the moment. Bye. And yes, Stephen, we do have um, Alan Durango rifle bags in stock. I think these are scope bags. That's yeah, a scope bag. Yeah, it's a big one on top. Yep. Do you want to pass them, man? Yeah, sure. Yes. So it's got the scope, part, yep. 
They do have enough movement in them also if you want to put a bike on them. They're, they're deep through here, they're not skinny. And they're 48 bucks. Yeah, we've got, I think we've got a few on there at the shelf at the moment. So yeah. they're pretty popular. That's though. their base model bag. Like it's a good bag, it's still got a lot of cushioning in it. It just doesn't have all the bells and whistles of some of our more expensive bags, you know what I'm saying? But that being said, that kind of stuff is a bit hard to get at the moment. So yeah, get it while you can. Scopes, a big run on scopes this week. Um, big run on powder. We had a powder delivery, as you would have seen. Um, we actually had uh, two deliveries, sort of one and a half deliveries. Um, and all the OA it went. Oh, I did good. Yeah, the whole lot in like a day. So, um, but we're getting regular deliveries of ADI. So if you guys want ADI powder, best thing to do is get put your name down. That way you're guaranteed to get one when, when we get it. So guess what oh, Bill's talking about. Oh. Well, fucking 303s, just for something different. Just for something different, we'll talk about 303 ammo tonight. And I'm, I apologise because I've been looking for a book, which I have a bookmarking, which gives me all production figures for the Welsh Pool Ammunition Factory that operated in uh, up there in, on Welsh Pool Road between about 1940 and 45. Um, obviously, at least until the 12th month of 45, because here I have a, um, this is a 50, 50 round bandolier for 303 ammo, which was then later on converted to use as a 50 round bandolier for um, 7.62 ammo. Great for shotgun ammo, I believe. Dad used to use one of those for fox hunting. Here. This is um, this is actually a, a bandolier that was made here in WA probably, and it was filled by uh, Welsh Pool with uh, Mark 7 ammunition, and it's a bit hard to see, 8th of the 11th, probably 44, it's a bit hard to see, they crossed that out, mm. and then it was reused in on the 21st of the 12th, 45, and MW is printed on, on, on both times, so this was obviously issued here in WA, I'd say, and used up and then returned to Welsh Pool to get reused. But they didn't only make uh, and, and fill bandoliers, they made um, ammunition and boxed it. This is a box of um, virtually pristine uh, Mark 7 ammo made at, made at uh, Welsh Pool in 1945 uh, the, the box has seen a bit of work but this is a bit later one it's got the yeah that's right the things but it's a 1956 but it's foot scrape yeah that's right they kept making them but that's a foot scrape bandolier that's right with foot scrape I, I think it's got foot scrape ammo yeah well it, i pulled some out there yeah, yeah, look, yeah right so they made the bandoliers and the ammo Probably. In probably the same be. plant? Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. But see, it, it makes me think that they were made in the same plant because there's no other maker's name on it. Usually everything that got made for the military had to have its, had to have the maker's name on it so that they knew where to go. If, um, I don't know if you can see the... It is a bit tricky, but yeah. It says 50, so 50 rounds, ball 303, mark 7, which is the ammo. So that's the 174 grain full metal jacket. That's right. 12th yeah. months of November 1956, MF, which is manufactured foot scray, CGCF, I don't know what that is, cartridge. I don't know, I have to look that one up. Australia, Defense. and then De Department of Defence with the arrow. Yeah. 1956. Yeah. And this one is a little bit less of, um, it's got 50, 50 rounds, ball 303, mark 7, the date and MW for the uh, Welsh pool. Um, uh, just, just interrupt you there. Sorry, Stephen, I don't think we do have any of the tin can rifle bags. No, they're the short ones, 44 inch. Yeah. We'll have to find out for you if we can get you one. Group of 22s and that sort of thing. 
Yeah, this this am, ammunition in this box is uh, dated 45, so they were still making ammo into 45. I've got a, a clip here which has got MW ammo in it, uh, 1943. Um, yeah, all 1943. Um, they're, the, they're the clips, I don't know where they came from. They've got, they've got a, a number on them, but that's about it. Um, that's some more <laughs> Wellspool ammo. Someone's turned it into soft points by grinding the, the tips off them. Uh, interesting enough. Good old cocky ingenuity. Yeah, that's right. It's good. It's good until you get an armour piercing one. And, <laughs> yeah. and or, 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 or an incendiary, yeah. yeah. BP Mark IV. Yeah, Mark IV clip. These are the earlier ones. These, that's a later model clip. With the circles on the back? Yeah, with the circles. That's the earlier model one with slots cut in it. It's just so it gives it some resilience, some spring. When you put the rounds in there, they don't fall out. Um, and also to save themselves a bit of material. The, the Colonial Ammunition Factory, went, which was first, um, when it first got going, its first order from the government wasn't ammunition, it was clips. Yeah. And they made, I can't remember, 30,000 or somebody in their first order. Uh, or might have been more, but anyway. Um, the interesting thing about, <clears throat> a few interesting things about the Wellspool Factory was their first batch of ammo that they made, I think in 1941, <laughs> didn't meet army specifications, so it was all destroyed. Um, <laughs> good start. Mm. What, um, what was wrong with it? I can't remember whether it was, didn't meet the velocity spec or something. I can't remember honestly what it was, but it didn't meet the army specifications, so they destroyed it all. But um, then about early, early 42, um, with the onslaught of the Japanese, when the Japs had, had uh, come, were coming down through the Indonesia and had bombed Darwin and so on, the government uh, panicked and ordered that the um, Welsh Pool factory be dismantled and packed up and shipped to the east. It just shows you how much faith our federal government had in us at that time. Well, that was the the whole plan was to retreat back to yeah yeah we. Southeast and Australia. We, we, we were kind of the um, Brisbane line, yeah. Disposable. Yeah, we were. But anyway, apparently they, they packed up part of the plant, and I've seen a photograph which is was captioned as um, a factory in Kalgoorlie that was manufacturing ammunition there. And I, I, from my memory, I have to find this photograph again. From my memory, the caption said they were making parts for artillery ammunition, 25 pound ammo. So it might be that the- 25 pounder, what's that? That's a big one. That howitzer. Yeah, the little howitzer, bit, howitzer that, um, they're, they're short short cases. Well, I yeah, yeah, 88 mil. I was gonna say, it's yeah. like 88 mil. Yeah, I think it was a three inch. Yeah. Well, it was a decent size. Yeah, it was. A oh, low velocity stuff, but. But this factory in, in Kalgoorlie was probably only a small one, but it was making Apparently, it was making ammunition components. Um, yeah, and it may well be that when they started, decided to pack up the Wellspool factory and move it, only got as far as Kalgoorlie and the threat had disappeared. So, the, but anyway, the, the Wellspool factory kept man, manufacturing ammunition at Wellspool uh, until at least 1945. So, because that's when that, that box of ammo was made there. Um, I can't read it very well. Um, how many rounds in you? I haven't counted them, I haven't taken them apart. But um, it could well be there's, there's uh, something like 35 rounds in there, which was a bring gun magazine plus a couple. Uh, just in case you fumbled when you were filling the magazine up. Mm. You didn't have to bend down and pick that one up out of the mud. Yeah, and suck it clean, you know. Give it, yeah, give it a lick and <laughs> put it back in the rubber off on your shirt. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, so, and, and there were um, factories all around Australia manufacturing uh, 303 ammo. Uh, I think at, at, at least five. There was one in South Australia, one in Queensland, one in Victoria, of course. 
I can't remember what, what, what the most likely one in New South Wales, I'm pretty sure, and the one here in WA. So it's Welsh Pool, Footscray. Yeah, Hendon in South Australia. Hendon, yeah. I can't remember the night where the other ones were. There was probably one at Liscard, manufacturing ammunition, I would imagine. I've never seen an ML stand no. back on memory. No, but it might have been for you know another little town near Lisco there somewhere because yeah, they yeah. had feeder factories around in Bathurst and uh, what Orange where another oh, Orange I've, I've seen OA a lot on scabbards and, and, right, and yeah. bayonets and shit yeah OA Orange was must have been quite a factory because they made a lot of stuff there and sight parts yeah, uh, yeah. safety catches. Um, uh, strikers, you know, the cocking knob on the on the back of a 303. Yeah. Um, quite often see them with a, OA on them. Bolt heads. Bolt heads, yeah. You know, they made the, these little factories. So quite a finicky little ship. Was it right, yeah. Yeah. Orange, yeah. My word. Um, it just shows you, once upon a time, here in Australia, we could make anything. Well, we had... The, there was an industry that could ramp up because yeah. we, we don't know what those companies were doing prior to no, the war. Right. Well, they may not have existed. No, probably not. Well, those, some of those feeder factories probably did. That's the thing. In the time of war, they fucking you got some guys that said we can do, we can make bloody bayonets. Yeah. And they built a factory and started making it. Yeah. Well, uh, interesting uh, thing about that is that General Motors Holden. We're making 25 pounders. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gaston Brothers in, I think they're in uh, Bendigo, they're in Victoria, but not in not in Melbourne. They were making uh, Morden. Mm. Uh, and, and years later, I was working on International Harvester Headers, and Gaston Brothers were making parts for the International Harvester Headers. Mm. <laughs> They, they were a company that just kept going and they could make pretty well make anything. One, yeah. one, one thing that I love is um, the Austin was made by some tractor manufacturer or something like they were die casting the receivers, I think. Yeah, that's right. And it was just like a die cast factory that used to make machine well, guns yeah, or something. Lysa. Yeah, that's we're it. Making, we're making the iron gun. Yeah, but it's not a terribly complicated fucking thing. I'd rather make an entire Owen gun. Than the bolt head for a fucking number one mark. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that right. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. right. It would have been much easier. You would have made five or six by the time you made one bolt head. Yeah. Um, who else was there? Was there were other companies that, that uh, jumped in? Oh, Slazenger. You know, mm -hmm. tennis racket, cricket bats, that sort of thing. They were making all the wood for three or three number one mark threes. Uh, by mm -hmm. the end, by probably by about 1943, you'll see quite often on the wood on a on a 303 up near the nose cap, just under the nose cap, S L A Z, and that's Slazenger in Sydney. Where were they getting the wood from? I don't know. In Australia, probably yeah, coachwood. Yeah, coachwood they were using. Yeah. So was there teams of blokes out there knocking fucking coachwood trees down? Yeah. Anybody and and kiln drying it. You know, they would have had to be six yeah. or eight months in front yeah. of the production. Yeah, because uh, that's what you quite often see. Um, a 303 on the uh, butt socket marked, you know, like Lusco 1941, and uh, the, the butt will have 1942 or 43 on it, and so will the forward. So Lusco were knocking out the, the actions, and perhaps it was a little while for the wood to catch up. Well, yeah. that, that's why the Germans went with laminate for their mouses. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's quicker to produce. We were, perhaps, in Australia, we were lucky that we had enough timber to cut, to knock down. I reckon what, in England, that was one of the biggest things that happened during the First World War, as well as the Second World War, was a depletion of their forests because of knocking down timber, not just for uh, manufacturing forests, oh, but structural timber, and bloody yeah. roadworks and buildings and so on, you know. Uh, you know, if you had to make scaffolding up a building that's fallen down, yeah. uh, timber from somewhere. And one of the, one of the uh, books that I read was about uh, England asking Australia and New Zealand for uh, people who were, had worked in the timber industry. They mm. wanted them in, in England. And in the first war, France lost a lot of their forests too, <laughs> to destruction, to shell fire, no doubt. Mm. But 
as well, but also to, for building bridges and walkways and, and refurbishing timber tip, uh, buildings. But yeah, I have a, um, a query from a, one of our old customers about um, whether uh, uh, Welsh Pool, he, he saw a photo of a, a Welsh Pool throughout a three round <coughs> with a single hole in the, in the um, as a flash hole. But then on a closer look, he saw that there was the original two tiny little holes there for the burden primer. So someone had just drilled a hole in it, and perhaps they were thinking they could fit a box of primers in there, but the primer diameter is different again, so it wouldn't have been terribly successful. But there were companies making box of primed ammunition during the Second World War. Um, Dominion uh, in Canada and Winchester uh, in the US were, had big contracts with the um, the Winchester had big contracts with the British Army and Canada, of course, were making ammunition for their own army. They had a, quite a large uh, contingent fighting in uh, Europe. Um, and I can't remember the, the code now, but there's um, a code on them that tells you that it's also that it's loaded with um, nitrocellulose, which, you know, ordinary gunpowder, rather than cordite. And in the Dominion, uh, ammunition was quite popular after the war uh, because it was relatable, you know. Um, and I never found out about it until after I, I, I bought a box of Dominion ammunition when I was young and silly and shot a fair bit of it off before one day I realised that it was a box of prime. And I thought, well, what a deal. All that stuff that's out in the paddock still. Things I can throw it away. Yeah. How many troops did the Canadians have in? Because they just fought in the... No, but, but they had a home front on both sides. And what do you mean? What? Well, the Canadians... Canadians fought in... In Europe. Yeah, in yeah, France, in but Europe. they also had the yeah. um, the Pacific home front to defend against Japanese. Did they? Yep. Um, it was, it was small. Fought against the Japs. Why? But they, they went... The army wasn't deployed against the Japs, but they had defensive, I believe. Yeah. The, the, Navy, the Navy fought the Japs. The Air Force yeah. fought the Japs. Yeah. Um, they also had a small amount of forces on the um, East Coast, I believe. Yeah, well, you see, the, the Japanese had taken over two islands in the Aleutian. Yeah. They kicked the Americans yeah. out of them. However, the, the Germans also landed weather stations on Canadian soil. Yeah. So yeah. they were also Up in, worried about in, that. In Greenland and on mm. those, some of those islands, in those and some of them were still found, were, were still being discovered like thirty years after the yeah. war. Well, right. they were using them, yeah, for predicting weather. Um, yeah, that because was the weather came out of the North Atlantic, I suppose, into, mm. into Europe. So. That was a massive yeah. advantage the Allies had was that we had control of the water there, so we could predict the weather. Yeah. So if they wanted to bomb England, they needed to figure out what we needed to plan. <laughs> there was, there's, I've read a book about the the German weather stations and on one of the islands there was a German weather station on one part of the island and I think it was an American base or a weather station perhaps I'm not sure but some American troops on another part of the island and they got to know that each other was there they didn't know for a start that there was opposing troops there and by me down they could talk to one another on the same radio frequency and they were most of their conversations were swear words, you know, that crack abusing the other. the other each other. Yeah, I don't think that they ever came to blows, but there was another um, German weather station on a, I think, on a Norwegian island. Mm. I'm not sure where, up in the North Atlantic, of course, and and that that came to blows. The uh, and the Norwegians um, suffered some casualties there. And I think the Germans did too, but. The Germans virtually won out, and in the end, but the Germans, when they realised that the war was being lost, they pulled these uh, troops out of the, or whether they were troops or civilians, I'm not sure. There were troops there, obviously, because mm. there was some shooting going on. But they took them out. Well, the Canadians, though, they had quite a few people in... Did they fight in North Africa at all? No, no Canadians. There was uh, I mean, there, everyone but, I think. There might have been volunteers oh, from Canada yeah. fighting with the English. Yeah. 
Um, but I mainly fought on the French. The yeah, French front. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or I mean, that, Normandy way. That, they had their own beach in yeah, Normandy. Yeah, they landed on one of the beaches there. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know I think it was? No, I can't remember. Well, no, you wouldn't be able to remember, but... Yeah. Mm. <coughs> they packed the Germans up a bit, or...? Oh yeah, they were they were good troops, well well trained and well armed, you know. Yeah. Number four days. Number fours. Oh okay. They were building yeah. number fours at uh, Long Ground oh. too. I'm pretty sure they were also in the Canadians are also involved in French landings well before then. Like I think. On the south coast. No, it was it was on the um in, on the Channel. I think it was in 1942. There was oh, a landing. Um, they it was one of their first experimental landings the where Dieppe. they thought. The Dieppe. Yeah, no, that's it. Was it Dieppe? Or... I think I think it was Dieppe. Um, San Nazir. Now San, San Nazir was um, English commanders. Yeah. That's a fascinating story. Um, right. Tragic, <laughs> but fascinating. Um, but yeah, the um, Canadian landing at Dieppe, they were experimenting with um, amphibious assault tactics. Yeah. And thought, well, we'll use up some expendable colonials instead of the valuable English yeah, that's troops. Right. Yeah. And, and a few um, tanks, old yeah, tanks. Oh, well, they weren't old, they were brand new. It was, um, they were Churchill's. The really? first time they were ever used, and well, they, they, were, too, they yeah. had 60 ready to go. One landing craft didn't make it, so 30 of them were saved. And of the 30 that landed, um, 28 were captured by the Germans. Yeah. And the Germans hated them. The Germans thought they were rubbish. Yeah. Mark one of Mark Three Churchills. <laughs> you know, was, I've got a photograph somewhere of, of the Germans inspecting one of, their, mm. one of these tanks. They got it into, the, into a uh, town. Yeah. Right into the town, and yeah. then they've got. I don't know whether they hit it with a bloody rocket or something and knocked it out. Yeah, well, I mean, they all would have been shot at the end just to figure out where the weak parts of the armour yeah. are. Apparently, though, it was the pebbles on the beach of Diet and the angle of the shore destroyed the tracks. Oh, yeah. Um, and apparently it was just a freak of nature where this one, you know, this one type of pebble found in this one beach yeah. was just bad for this one type of tank track. <laughs> but there's a bit of a segue for you. Yeah. We're talking about ammo and now we're talking about... Yeah. But um, but the Canadians uh, did very well. They went up through Belgium and Holland because mm -hmm. um, an old client of ours, um, oh Birkin, yeah Joe, Joe yeah. Birkin, yeah Joe Birkin, yeah he um he was telling us he was a child in the time when the Canadians came through and he remembers the Canadians and he said. They went through and the Germans had gone and he said then the Canadians had gone, you know. And uh, and he said there was all manner of stuff left behind, you know, rifles yeah, right. and all sorts of stuff. And he said they had a they picked up a submachine gun of some kind and a pistol. <laughs> Good things for kids to play with. But they had it they had it down in the they had a coal base, the basement where they kept the coal for their fires. He said, we'd sometimes go down there and fire the submachine gun into the coal. <laughs> but it was a bit dangerous because the coal might be Yeah. Burn your house. Yeah, but the, uh, yeah, the Canadians did. Well, and I know the Germans were terrified of the Canadians because of the reputation from the First World War. Yeah. And that sort of carried. Yeah. You know, where one unit, you know, 94% casualty rate, but, you know, they fought to the death sort of thing against yeah. the Germans. I, yeah. I believe that they were the only, only, um, colonial royal brigade of some sort. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember the unit, though. Nova Scotia? There was a Nova Scotia unit, but there was a Princess Patricia, uh, uh, division, mm. which was well regarded. Uh, it's still, and anyway. it's still, yeah, but anyway. Big as fuck, none of us can make it. No, that's right. Yeah. But anyway, there you go. So, yeah, right. we, we've got, we do have a uh, connection with 303 Ammunition Manufacturing here in WA. So, um, yep, the shit stuff was made here. Yeah. <laughs> all right, two weeks ago I said to everyone that I'd take you all through and show you what sort of stuff gunsmiths use to fix guns, so... I am going to, if you can take it. Take it through? Um, I'll take you through and show you my work area. Alrighty. It's going to be a bit shaky, guys. Bear with me. Alright, oh, that's not going to fit through there. So, 
You've never been through the hall. This is Bill's wonderful new map. Apparently, he hasn't worked out how to use Google Maps yet, so he just bought a map of WA. So, if you come through, this is usually where I do any of the hand fitting and stuff that I do, and I've got about three or four jobs on at the moment. Um, but this is my desk, which is currently covered in shit. Um, like it usually is. Yeah, and I've got to, I've got to clean it up. So I've got all my weird Allen keys and stuff here. Um, and then I've got my torque spits, metric and imperial Allen keys. And they're all, everything that I, uh, that's here I use every day pretty much. Yeah? So I've got some little screwdrivers, some bigger screwdrivers. I got that from Manson when I bought some reamers from him once. And it is just the handiest tool because it's, it's quite often you find that you don't have the right size screwdriver bit. I don't know why, but this one's got two Phillips and two crossheads, and they're nicely ground as well, and they're just really good for gunsmithing. Interchangeable ones are often pretty bad. Look, that, that one looks really well made and really nice yeah. to use. This is an interchangeable set that I've had since crossplay pullback, and the handles are fucked on it now. Um, but And I've got a heap of little, little screwdriver bits, but almost probably 50% of them I've ground custom for a particular job, you know, so... I've got a screwdriver bit here specifically for Smith and Wessons, and then I've got another one here specifically for Remingtons, and I've got you know so I've got a heap of custom stuff there. Do you mark which one's which? No, I just know which one's. Yeah, of course which. not. No, yeah. no one else needs to know. Yeah. So, but I, I and I've got a little vice here. So I'm a fan. So I've got a few punches here. I don't use punches as much as I used to. I use them a little bit. Um, but I've got a couple of nice punches here that I have been using for a long time and I really like. Um, otherwise, if I need something else, I pinch it from Bill. Bill uses punches much more than what I do. Um, and then I've got a selection of pillar files, which I'm actually in the midst of using at the moment. Um, so there's a heap of different pillar files here. There's ones that we've ground um, safe edges on, again, for doing specific jobs and that sort of stuff. So, but a really good set of files are uh, very important. So you need a, a like a really fine one, this is a double O, and then you need like an O or a one, um, which is better for like wooden alley and that sort of stuff, because that's better for steel. Um, I've got a, set, a little set of diamond files here, but I avoid using them where I can, um, because if you need to use diamond files, it's you know, something, something's going wrong. If you've got good files, you don't need diamond files. Um, and then Bill's, Bill does all his crap over there and he keeps his desk much cleaner than mine because he works on it much more. Um, plenty, whereas, plenty a bit cleaner. Oh, he works at his desk much more than what I do though. I'm usually down the back, which is where I'll take it out. So as we go past here, uh, I've actually got a stock here that's got alloy pillars that are being fitted and they're getting glued in now. Oh, is that, um, is that the one for the barrel that you had the muzzle cap on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was on Facebook yesterday. So you can see that my glue, it's taken a few hours, but it's just starting to set. The trick is with, with glues, like bedding glues, you don't want them to shrink, yeah? Because if they shrink and change proportions and shit while they're going off, it's bad. And so we use a glue which is doesn't heat up, so the, the, it's not a very vigorous chemical... Um, uh, chemistry that happens between the two parts of the epoxy. So it takes much longer for it to go off, but it doesn't shrink and it's a much better glue once it's gone off. Um, so I'm glued that pillar in, that one's already glued in. Um, so how long do you normally leave pillars? Minimum, uh, that glue I'd leave it minimum 24 hours. Yeah. And I wouldn't, sh like if you bet at a rifle with the epoxy, I'm not going to tell you what epoxy we use. Yeah. Because uh, it's taken a long time to get the right stuff um, but once this bedding stuff's gone off we wouldn't take any metal work out if we were bedding a rifle we wouldn't take any metal work out for at least 24 hours and we wouldn't shoot the rifle for at least two or three days um, just to make sure it's set properly does, over here's where our cleaning stuff is does the weather have much to do with um I'm gonna pack those away before I go tonight. With cure, does the weather have much to do with curing times when it comes to this, yeah, yeah, this yeah. glue yeah it does yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got all your different jags and brushes for all the different calibers, patches behind it, different cleaning rods for different things from 20 cow, 22, 30 cow, shotgun. So there's a, there's a collection 
a selection of, of stuff there. Um, so if you need to clean a gun, it's everything's right here, you just dump your gun here and, and clean it. And underneath here is where we keep our endoscope, which is under there. So optic fibers and stuff. So while we've got a gun here that we're cleaning, we can put an endoscope down the barrel and just check out what's going on, which is pretty handy. Like if you want to be able to build accurate guns and with good barrels and that sort of stuff, you really need a good, you know, good microscope. Um, at minimum loops um, and a good endoscope. So, um, this is actually my bag of stuff that I take out whenever I, I go out anywhere. Um, so it's it's a general tool set that I use. It's just miniature versions of everything that's over there. People who've been to Billy Farm will recognise that bag. Yeah, exactly. So there's all sorts of stuff in here, torques, drives and whatnot, and um, torque spanners and shit. Um, and all my aim point stuff as well. So that goes with me anytime I'm out, just so I can work on a gun, and I've got everything I need in that bag pretty much to be able to work on any guns. Um, I use Chuck's wife a lot. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people like, like Bill likes cloth, like proper cotton cloth. Um, I don't. I like using Chuck's wife because I rip a piece off, use it, and then throw it in the bin. And that way I'm not carting anything like wood dust or metal filings or anything around with me. Um, a bit wasteful, but at the end of the day, the guns that I'm working on are worth a bit of money, so I don't want to scratch them up. Um, so that's the butt for for a trench gun, which I was talking about before. So I've got to make a, a block which goes inside there, so it'll slide onto the gun, so you can take it on and off, so he doesn't have to use that epoxy bolt. So, and then down the back here is where a lot of the main work done and some of you guys would have seen some of this before yeah there was a video we did a couple of couple of years ago yeah this is bill's but... bridgeport so he's had this since cross plate pullback and um Jerusalem, yeah. yeah and uh but it's, it's good machine and it's good you know for doing quick work and stuff like that uh bill did put a digital readout on it a few years ago now which was it's been brilliant like it makes it so much easier um, but this machine is really cool. So, you know, you can obviously lift the bed up and down, move the bed in and out, left and right. We fitted a fourth axis to it so you can hold round things and, and turn things to precise angles and that sort of stuff. Um, it's got its automatic feeds and all that sort of stuff. And it's, uh, that's for dropping the speed down. So it's two speed motor, but you can change the belts and everything to change the speeds to get your speeds right for your tooling. Um, and then and he's got a separate digital readout for elevation but you can actually turn the whole head of this mill right around so you can work right over there or right up at this end of the bed um, if need be and you can bring this in and out and you can tilt the head left and right um, quite accurately if you need to work inside something so that's pretty cool so it's a good machine um, then you've got the little lay now the little lay has been here again we've had this for a long time and um, okay. will eventually retire it, but over 20 years now. Yeah. yeah, but it's a good little machine. It's in metric, um, and it doesn't have the only thing it doesn't have is like um, automatic stops and stuff like that. So you can do some really good work on this sort of thing. It's just not as user friendly as some of the other ones that we use. But we chambered a lot of barrels and everything in this gun a long, you know, for a long time. This was our main lay. And um, yeah, so that's what it is. Now this cupboard here is a lot of the precision tooling and everything that we use is usually kept in this cupboard. The depth micrometers are out at the moment, but you know the stuff that we use for measuring on the inside of inside of um, tubes and stuff. If we need an old precise diameter, we've got all those sorts of tooling there. Um, micrometers, inside and outside micrometers, all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, builds long series drills. So if you've got a barrel and you know there's some value in the gun, you know, uh, you don't want to replace the barrel in it, the whole barrel, because you want to keep the authenticity of the outside of the barrel. Well, we can put sleeves in guns, but to put a sleeve in a gun, you need to drill the center of the old barrel out and then get a sleeve to press in it. So you need long series drills, which is what this is. No. Um, well, that was one. That was one to remove. That's not for a sleeve. But, no. Yeah. But there's that one was to remove a stuck pull through. Yeah. <laughs> and 
another tool you made for a specific job. Yeah, that's that's the drilling out of barrel, yes. So you can see it's got the double step and that self pilots itself properly. Yeah, I actually ground that one up to do a 44. Yeah. So there's, there's, a 30, there's a 32 one there. There's a heap of old high speed steel tooling that Bill used to use before um, before you know we started getting into tungsten carbide replaceable tip tooling. Um, so that's pretty much useless now. I don't know why he hangs on to it. You could probably use that to put all your fucking chuck all that shit in a bin yeah. and then put all your proper tools in there. Um, but what I wanted to show you guys is just the number of taps that we've got. I'm not going to pull it out. I want you guys to have a look. So if you have a look here, we've got... Um, it's a bit dark in there, but... It's hard to see, but BASF, UNC, number, number and gauge taps, UNF taps, dies, uh, that's, um, that's Imperial UNF, metric, and our specials box. So they're, they're all taps that we use all the time. Like there's hundreds and hundreds of taps there. That's better, cheers. There, we use all of these sorts of things all the time. But, and if you have a look at our specials box, oh, this is also, we are replacing all our taps and everything with, with proper um, Fury taps, like gun taps. So this is one that I've just used just a second ago, actually. So it's a little three mil gun tap. And mm -hmm. these things are so good. They make your life so much easier. Thanks. So we're replacing all of them. So that's the they're they're for actually for tapping through a through hole yeah. where it pushes the material in front of the tap rather than yeah uh, rather than gathering it up into flutes. Yeah, you can get taps for doing blind holes as well, like yeah. this. So that's specifically a, a spiral tap for a for a um, for a blind hole. So it actually, as it taps, it pulls the material up out of the hole rather yeah. than pushing it down in the bottom. Yeah. So we've got both of them because it is so much easier to do good work when you've got good tools. So um, this is our, our odds, odds and inbox. So we've got taps here, that tap specifically for the Hornady lock and load tool so we can thread people's cases to using the lock and load tool. We've got, actually that would have been, oh, 417 by 20 BSW. That's a good one. Yeah. You use that one all the time. Um, that was that was the no. Was it the? So yeah. that's a made up tap. Capital. Well, you reckon that was the three hundred three? Yeah, I think that was the original three hundred three tap that I got, which was wrong. Yeah. Um, that is a five hundred and seventy eight thou by twenty eight tap. Now that tap, it's it's a it's not a common like it's not a thread that's any part of any common set you know it's not metric or it's not a common imperial set that tap is specifically for 45 cow barrels so it's the right depth and everything so you can get a 45 cow barrel and they might only measure 580 600 thou on the outside but you can tap it to that size so it's not too small on the inside so you're not going to rupture the barrel so you can put a muzzle brake on it or something like that so that's a very specific tooling. So then you've got half inch 28s and half inch 20s, which are common muzzle threads for silencers in Europe. Then you've got, um, we've got your 916 24s and 58 24s. So common for center fire muzzle brakes and that sort of stuff. Three quarter 24s. We've got 58 24 double start taps. One inch 20, an inch and an eight 16. They're common like action threads. That's a common, Inch and an eight, 16, that's like a um, Savage and shit. Yeah. Oh no, Savage is inch and an eight, 20. Yeah, no, that might be Remington. No, nah, Remington's inch and a 16, oh, 16. That's right. Um, 26 by 1.5, which is Howard and Weatherby. We've got that tap. There's just fucking so many different threads. And now all your metric ones, 15, 14, 18, 20, 22. 22 by one, 22 by 1.5, 26 by 1.5. Yeah, there's just so many different threads and shit. What's that? 14 by 1. Oh, I thought we didn't have a 14 by 1 no, tap. I found it, yeah. Yeah, we got it made. One. I think that's all we got made too. Yeah, it's a Gurig one, though. Oh, I know. Oh, so, but I can do a lot of those sorts of threads on my CNC as well. Oh, but I'll show you that in a second. What about those? So that's all then. Oh, 
Chamber rumours. We need a bigger thing for our chamber rumours. It's been, this is too small and it has been for a little while. We still manage to get everything in it, but. So we've got 17, 22 cow rumours. So you've got like your 17 squeeze bores, 17 uh, WS, uh, 17, not WSM, HMR, 17 Remington, 17 Hornet, uh, 20 Tactical, 204, 20 PPC, all the way up to like 22 to 50, 22 to 50 Ackley Improved, 220 Swift, that sort of stuff. That's a 220 Swift Ackley Improved reamer. But you'll notice there's no neck or throat on the reamer because I like to cut my neck and throat separately. Neck and, having your neck and your throat of the chamber perfectly in line with the bore is one of the most important things for accuracy. And if you're cutting the body as well as the neck and the throat at the same time, it can push your reamer off. And so I like to cut them separately. It also gives me more versatility. So that's a neck and throat reamer specifically for 22. So all it does is cut the, the neck and the throat. And this will be a specific diameter. So this is a, a 0.2595 neck diameter. So it's a tighter neck diameter if you wanted to turn your case. But there's a heap of different neck and throat rumors there as well. So that's 22. 6 mil and 25 cow. So your PPCs, your 243s. I've got a 6x284. If you order a custom reamer from Manson, they send it to you in this little walnut box. So you slide the lid off. And there's your custom reamer. At least they used to. I don't know if they still do. But, still do. Uh, this is a 22 by 47 Lapua reamer. Mm -hmm which is quite cute. So I've actually got a shitload of these boxes that are in there. I take them out and put them in these so it's easier to see what you're looking at. 2506, I've got a couple of 2506 reamers here, like a standard one and a tight neck reamer. Uh, 6.5s and 7 mils, so your 6.5 Creedmoors and that sort of stuff is in here, up to 28, uh, 280 Remington. 7mm Ultra Mag, that sort of stuff. So that's a 280 Ackley Improved Reamer. Just a standard reamer. I've also got one here, the one next to it, which is a 280 Ackley, but again, no neck and throat. So I can cut that separately. If someone wants a tight neck or something like that. Another custom reamer here, 6.5 Weatherby RPM. You would have seen I've got some brass in recently, so I'll have to build a gun for that now. I ordered that reamer before it was a production item, so. Um, this is an interesting one, the one that I just used recently. Ruger Compact Magnum. So I built myself a 300 Ruger Compact Magnum just recently. That's the reamer that I use. Mm. But this is actually for six, can go down to six mil. So again, having no neck and throat means that I could form cases down to 25 cow six mil and ream the chamber with this the same reamer and just do the neck and throat separately. So that's pretty cool. Special reamer. 6mm, 7mm Remington Magnum, or 6mm Mac 4, as Max Ray, who was the inventor of that calibre, calls it. So 30 cow reamers, 30 cow gets the same box because it's there's just so many of them. <coughs> so I've got a special 300 win mag, Reamer here. Oh, that's the interchangeable pilot one. Oh, that's oh the most important one in there. 303 British. Look at that. He's fucked. We fucked two of them, remember? No, Trying no. to do that. No, no, no. We ordered the wrong ones. That's yeah. right. We ordered the wrong ones to. 30325. For a 30325. Because yeah. 30325, the shoulder's actually further back. So it's a specific chamber. And that's what like, we wanted the full length case version. Yeah. This is a 300 win mag, body reamer only. So it doesn't ream the belt and it doesn't do the neck and throat. So you've got to do this, ream, this chamber in three stages. What it allows you to do is you can full length size your cases and then headspace the cases on the shoulder, not on the belt. So that way you don't get case stretch. And then you can ream the belt separately with this reamer. So that just does the belt. And then you can do the neck and throat separately. So that way you can have a 300 win mag, but headspace it on the shoulder. You still take factory ammo and everything, but it means that once you start reloading, you're not going to stretch your brass and that sort of stuff. And you get better performance out of it. 
303 up to 338. So 303 should be in the next one, but this, this one's out of room. Yeah. Because the reams, reams are so fucking big. 450 Marlin, 310 Cadet, 375 Weatherby, 408 Shaytac. There's a heap of really fun ones in here. That is the 338 Snipe Tack. Is it Snipe Tack? 338. No, no, that's the Show Tack. Well, what's that one then? Oh, these are the headspace gauges. Someone's put them in the wrong box. Yeah. So they're just the headspace gauges for 408 Show Tack. They're supposed to go on the next drawer. They won't fit. They won't the... fit. That's why they're there. Oh, okay. That's the Snipe Tack Reamer. Yeah, we need a new drawer for all of Yeah, we need so. new compartments for it. Three throat Lapua, no neck, no throat. So it'll actually do three throat Lapua body, but you can actually neck it down to seven mil if you wanted to and have a seven mil Lapua. Eight mil Morza, so nine mil Luger, 357 maximum. Should do three headspace gauges, which is supposed to be in the next drawer. So these are all the headspace gauges. This is overflowing. So there's everything's here. Norma Mag, six mil Remington. Needs to be set out a bit better. Next one down. So this is for reaming and tapping chokes. So you can do Remington. We've got Beretta, Remington, wind choke. Um, so that you put the right pilot on here, depending on your bore for your shotgun, and use this to ream the, the front of the bore out until it hits this shoulder, and then you tap it out. The tap. And this is Benelli, so it's a buttress thread tap. Buttress? I can think. Uh, yeah. Buttress? Yeah. No, square thread. That's yeah. buttress, isn't it? No, buttress has got an angle on one side and flat on the other. Oh. Yeah. Well, what's a square thread? Just square thread? Yeah, I think it's just square okay. Well, that's what that is. Yeah? Yeah. Metric 20, 20.5 by 1. Yeah. <laughs> Great size, that is. So, I just happen to work in a... So if you want to get into shotguns, then you need all this sort of stuff. Oh, and there's 50 BMG. Match. And then a heap of tooling that helps you hold reamers. This is a uh, neck and throat reamer holder that I designed. So what it does is it's usually neck and throat reamers, you put the the neck and throat reamer into the, the pilot lot. There's an original one here from Manson, but it might have been, we, we fucked it, so which is why I made this. So you put the neck and throat reamer in there and you just do a screw up and the screw is supposed to hold it and they never do. You round the screw off um, and they, they stay in the barrel sometimes, you pull the yeah. thing off the back. So what we do is we grind a little recess in the, the reamer that's already done. So if you see at the back of the reamer, there's a little recess ground in there. Yeah. So that goes inside this holder, and it's a perfect fit. And it lines up with this hole, with this detent hole. We drop a little ball bearing in there and then screw this collar over top of the ball bearing so the ball bearing can't come out. And then that will that will never come apart. Like, you can't, you have to tear the back off the reamer to get it out. That is absolutely rigid. So it's much easier to do very precise chamber depths and that sort of stuff with this sort of tooling. And these are the sorts of things that, after you've been in the industry for, for a long time, you start to work out what, what best things to use are and how you can improve things. And these and are we, all- We've actually sent that attachment to our best barrel manufacturer for him to use it once. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. He wanted he wanted a neck neck and throat ring, yeah. so we sent him the whole sent him the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. I didn't realise I liked that piano. Yeah. Tell him not to steal my idea. Um, these are plastic bushes. Back in the days when we used to do all our chambering and everything in here, we used to press plastic bushes over the barrels to run centers on them to hold everything perfectly in line when we did chambering and that sort of stuff. We don't do that anymore because we use the other machine. Um, these are all the tooling for Bill's, Bill's machine. Um, all the blocks that you can use to, so you can block work up and then bolt it down, which are really, these are really handy. Um, 
parallels and all the bills um, tooling. So we pretty much exclusively use tungsten carbide tooling nowadays. Um, this one's a little bit worn out, but you can feed it much faster and it's much um, lower uh, pressure on the work and that sort of stuff, so you're less likely to chuck shit out. We'll go over the lathe first. So this is the big lathe. This is one of the newer machines that we've got here. It's probably about five or six years old now. Um, this is a, it's only metric or imperial because it uses a digital readout, yeah? Um, so you can swap between metric and imperial on there. And it's got probably a bit bigger bed than what we need for gunsmithing, but allows us a lot more versatility to make jigs and tools and all that sort of stuff to use for gunsmithing. So it's got a 1.5 metre bed. Um, it's got an 88 mil hole through the head, yeah, with an extra large chuck that goes on it. Um, so it's a big, heavy, rigid machine. So it was quite challenging when we first got this machine to actually do barrel work and stuff like that on it because it's so big and heavy and rigid, it's very hard to, to, to run it. So we've got a big center steady, which you see hasn't been used for a long time. It's down the bottom over there. This because it's so big and heavy, you just can't get it on and off all the time. So we don't use a center steady anymore. But you'll see that this is all the, the collet tooling that we use. So a lot of the time now, I don't use standard chucks and whatnot, I use collets. Collets are a lot, you get a lot more bearing area on your tool if you're using it as a tool holder or work if you're using it as a work holder. Um, they're also a lot more accurate, so they hold center a lot better. So I love collet, collet tooling. A lot of people don't like it, but once you've got all of the, your tooling, it's very easy to, to do, to use. So we've got ER32s, ER40s and ER50 collets for different, different things. So, and just recently I've got myself a little ER16 tool from a CNC so I can hold little tools and come right up to the work stuff and whatnot without risking hitting anything. And then they take these little, these little baby collets. So, they're really cool. So you can get so much pressure on a collet that we actually turned our barrel vise. We, we now use collets to hold barrels because you can get so much pressure on it all the way around the barrel rather than just crushing the barrel between two blocks, which a lot of people do. You know, you can machine blocks which fit the barrel, but you're still essentially you're just crushing it between two different blocks. Now we can, and we had a 20 ton jack. I'll show no, the lighting's not very good. But this is the original, not the original original, but this is a barrel vise that we made probably 12 or 15 years ago. And it was really good for a long time. So we would put a barrel in there and we would do this jack up. It's a 20 ton jack, so you get 40 ton on the, on the barrel if need be. It was, it's enough pressure to crush an action if you're silly enough to do the wrong thing. And we've since turned it into a collet thing. So you just get the, the right size collet for whatever barrel that you're pulling. So this is a 32 mm -hmm. to 34 mil collet because I was pulling a 32 mil barrel. Um, you just put that in there and then when you do it up, and then you just do the, the collet up and then when you do it up it crushes onto the barrel evenly all the way around holds it tight this barrel vise is so good that we can pull weatherby vanguard barrels without cutting into the barrels at all which is pretty unheard of like within the firearms industry people will understand that weatherby barrels and how barrels are incredibly difficult to get out and this will pull them without without any problem so and then this is all the tooling and everything for the big lathe. So we've got a box of shit here, yeah? Everyone needs one of these. This is just random off cuts. And every, anything that we get a random off cut, we've finished we're working with something. We, we, you know, this is a piece of barrel. We've just cut the end off it because the client wanted the barrel of a certain length. I've cut it off, it goes in there. And then if I need a piece of steel to make a tool or a jig or a job or something, I can just pull something out of here. You know, that's a 
piece of stainless, inch and a quarter. You know, if I needed to make a tool for something, you know, I've got I've got alley in here, I've got all sorts of shit. So it's a really handy thing to have. These are all the big drills that we've got. You know, if we're making job, you know, big jigs and tooling and stuff like that. So, and then coming across to here, this is the this shelf here I use more than anything else. So we've got center drills, but I've I've always permanently got a center drill set up in one of my collet tools, so I can just swap it in and out easily. Um, but drills, but um, thread files, that's really handy for putting it up against a thread, just to make sure that you're cutting the right thread. Um, there's nothing worse than making, you have one gear out on the lathe and you're cutting the wrong thread. Um, things for sanding and polishing, um, if you get a little nick on a ream, there's a stone there just to clean it up. Um, and scrapers. So making scrapers is incredibly difficult. It's an art in itself. Making a good scraper that works and cuts cleanly and doesn't vibrate and chip and that sort of stuff. And so I've made a few scrapers over the years. This is probably my favorite. Um, this one I just have to touch up every now and then. Um, but you can actually, it's, so it's a hand tool, but I can use it in the lathe and actually um, scrape material off, like metal off like it was butter, you know, you just, it just comes off cleanly. Um, just to break an edge, take a burr off, something like that. Um, so that works really well. Obviously you don't want to be doing it on like the mouth of a chamber if you need to put a center in or anything like that. Um, muzzle brakes that are most of the way being manufactured. This is one of the self timing ones. I've just got to put the flutes in it. Um, so you can actually fit this to your gun yourself. You screw it on um, and then you, you lock it up to time and then the nut that's on here is on a left hand thread and you can just undo that and it pushes up against the shoulder so you can time it up yourself. So I've just got to finish those off when I've got a spare second, which is never. Um, and then the tooling. So the tool that's in there at the moment is like a standard turning tool. Yeah. So this lathe's got a quick change turret. So, uh, tool post so that just cams over and locks it into place perfectly on center every time you take that off and you can just take the tool out and swap it out with something else so that's a standard turning like it's triangular turning tool that goes there but i've got 45 degree tools i've got boring tools so i've got solid carbide boring tools like that so the bar is solid tungsten and that's to reduce vibration because we're boring, so that's a, it's a, you're doing a very long bore for a very small diameter, so it's more likely to vibrate, so you need solid. See where if there's this one, it's a much bigger tool and I'm not boring as far, so it's just a high speed steel um, bar. So, well, not even high speed steel. Um, but I've got 45 degree tools like that one. That's really handy. It's a little bit big for some jobs. Uh, we've got inside threading tools, outside threading tools, parting off tools like that, and they all just drop straight in. So that's all the sort of tooling that you need as a gunsmith um, to do a lot of the work that we do on barrel work and that sort of stuff. You need, you need safety glasses, you should always be wearing safety glasses whenever you're working on guns. Um, there's a lot of springs and that sort of stuff that can end up in your eye if you're not careful, um, especially if you're playing around with triggers and that sort of stuff. But if you're out shooting, you should be shooting the glasses on as well. There's too many people who have pierced primers and that sort of stuff. You end up with a bit of powder leakage. Uh, you can end up with a bit of shit in your eye when you're down the, down the hospital. So, and then the last machine that I've got is my CNC, which is turned off at the moment, unfortunately. I'd like to have it turned on, but. Um, so I do all my, my conversational stuff. So I'll program everything on the computer and then I'll import it into here. Um, and then that tells the machine what to do. So it's just a three axis CNC. At the moment it's got a 32mm tool in it, which has got 200mm of depth, because I was making a big tool for a job that I'm doing, which I'll show you in a sec. Um, but it's got the fourth axis there for my muzzle brakes, um, and all these are special jigs and everything that I've made up over the years. That's a, um, so again, this is, uses the same collets as our barrel tool. Um, as a work holding jig, so you can drop a muzzle brake in there and work on it vertically. So that's a really nice and strong tool, uh, work holding jig. So 
And then you've got all the tools in the carousel here. So I've got inside threading tools, T tools, 60 degrees, they're all set up, ready to go. I've got a few more, but I can only fit 16 tools in the carousel. This is by far my favorite though. This one gets the most use. This is just an eight mil. It's a, it's a variable pitch, eight mil sod tungsten tool. It's really designed for real hard stainless and titaniums, but it works really well. You have to feed it quick, but it works really well on most materials, yeah? And I, these tool, this tool in particular just lasts and lasts and lasts. Like I use this tool more than anything else, probably use it 10 times more than anything else that's here. Um, and it just goes and goes and goes. So um, I like solid, solid tungsten tools because I can get a really nice depth of cut on it. Um, as opposed to tools that use inserts like this one, which I can only get about five mil depth on that at a time. Or I get double that on that tool. Um, so I've got to run it more programs on it and stuff. So, I mean, it's, I still like that tool. It's a nice big heavy tool. Um, and then we've got splitting saws and all sorts of shit at the back. So it's pretty, pretty handy machine. There's a lot of work. I'll probably work on this machine almost as much as the lathe just making tools and work holding jigs and all that sort of stuff a lot of what you do as a gunsmith is making tools to make the jobs easier to do so uh, if you're um, if you're interested in getting into gunsmithing um, certainly uh, get used to making a lot of tools and, and thinking about how to do things There's a lot of things you can't find on the internet and um, you have to work it out for yourself and make your own tooling because you can't buy tooling to do certain jobs um, so yeah so the reason I've gone through all this is because I do get asked probably weekly I get asked someone asked me how do I get into gunsmithing and you really need to become a fitter and turner first um, and that way there's some utility to you so that a gunsmith will take you on because you need to have worked in the industry yourself to be able to become a gunsmith but unfortunately it's actually technically illegal to work in the industry until you're a gunsmith, so it's sort of a catch-22 situation. So do your fitters and turners courses first, um, get comfortable with that sort of stuff, so that way you can make yourself some money um, while you're losing it, investing in all the tooling and everything that you need for gunsmithing. So um, if anyone's got any questions about gunsmithing or any of the tooling and stuff that we use, uh, just hit me up. So, but that's pretty much all the tooling that we that we use is the main bulk of it. We've also got a room down the back where we do a lot of the cleaning and everything in there. So we keep all the fumes and everything in there. We keep do painting and that sort of shit. Um, Sandblasting the booth, grinders and sanders, engraving rooms around the back. So it's the engraving machines in its own room. Um, but I'm not going to show you around too much in here because obviously it's a it's a security risk. Um, and the only other thing I can recommend is now I've been wearing an apron for a couple of years now and I highly recommend it. A, it keeps all the shit off you so I don't take it home and my boy gives me a hug and loses an eye. Um, but it's just handy having everything uh, right there. Now this knife that I've got in my pocket I've usually got in here so I've got a, a Spyderco knife that a mate gave me which I really appreciate. Um, and then I've got pens and sharpies and a little tape measure in there and then I've got my metric calipers and I've got my imperial calipers so if you want to do gunsmithing you really need to become comfortable using both metric and imperial because every gun uses pretty much both systems of measurement um, gunsmithing is a very old industry you know so um, imperial is still quite heavily used even on stuff like tickers and seikos use some imperial measurements. So that's all there is to it. Yeah, as far as Johnson's and goes. Thanks very much guys. I uh, hope there's a bit there to, to talk about. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I um get yourself good toy as well. If you if you're gonna get into gunsmithing, if you're gonna get into thing, don't go down and just buy shit cheap tooling. To do, oh, you know, I might only do it once type thing. If you're going to get into gunsmithing, you're never going to do something once. You're never going to use a tool once. Like, you know, it's the same as buying a good quality rifle scope. Like, buy once, cry once type thing. 
because if it breaks on the on the job, um, then it might cost you a bit more in the long run. So, but that's all there is to it. Yeah. All right, I think we're done for tonight. Plus, if that rain comes back, we won't be able to hear anything. Yeah, we won't be able to hear. Hope yeah. you guys have a have a great weekend. Sorry, Trent couldn't be here tonight, but he's a big sook. Had to look after his kids. And uh, but Trent and Ross will be on tomorrow, nine till four. I'm off tomorrow, so I'll see you guys next week. Cheers, and don't forget our specials are ending tomorrow. Specials end tomorrow. Specials. We've got two to three Blitz Kings. We've got a couple of twenty-two. And two long rifle ammunition. Grab and, that while it's on special. Yep. That might be hard to get soon. And hoppies. I think hoppies is fifteen percent off. Sweet. Yeah. So. See you then. Catch gotcha.